All right, so hello everyone, Major Gayed. Um, today I'll be covering my experience with deployed dentistry, BC, before Corona. And uh, Captain Zeller and Master Corporal McNeil will be discussing the post-COVID era. So far, I've noticed a mix in terms of the attendance um, for the presentation. So I'll be discussing some clinical portions and some deployment experience just to keep everyone interested. Just a quick disclosure, um, OPSEC here. There are certain aspects of uh, my experience overseas that I can't discuss on open lines for obvious reasons, but I'll be more than happy to discuss these with you um, when, we get meet, when we get to meet face to face. All right, so let's get into it. Um, our work routine over there, we were able to provide a great quality care. You know, uh, the MDC is such a function, functional unit. Uh, it's surprising how much materials we had. Very few were the moments that I felt like we lacked an instrument or a certain material to work with. And I think this is in great part due to the fact that the mission has been going on for a while and my previous colleagues have really done a great job equipping the clinic there. In terms of stats, we were busy. We saw something between 18 to 22 patients a week. It's all new patients. Um, you know, it's, this is, you know, the patient comes in, you have to fix it from A to Z, and then the patient goes to wherever he has to go uh, on the front line. And um, for the schedule, it was very similar to back home, eight to four, and uh, we obviously had to go in for emergencies every now and then over hours. Types of patients that we saw were mainly military personnel from the coalition forces and some civilian contractors that we treated sporadically according to the emergencies. Now, the, the nature of the mission makes it that there are many small bases all around Erbil. And when I got there, I initially thought I was only responsible for that city in Erbil uh, and the base there. But, you know, we had many patients flying in from a bit everywhere or even Metex calling in for, from remote places for advice. And we essentially either did teledentistry to guide them or we asked them to ship the patient in. And this would normally be done on the next flight in uh, on a routine run. Um, for my personal routine, just on pre-deployment, they stressed about they, they stressed a lot uh, the importance of having our own routine. Um, so this was mine, and uh, you know it, it makes a lot of sense because when everything is so different around you, um, having a, ver a, a stable routine or having something that you do on a regular kind of makes you feel a bit more at home. So um, the the only thing that I would add to that is um, don't wait till you deploy to. Uh, get into those good habits or get into starting these objectives do that prior chances are if you keep postponing these objectives and habits well chances are once you deploy you might as well um, postpone there too and you might be busy with other things for instance if you have a french course that you want to you know start start it prior and like this once you get to uh, once you get overseas you can hit the ground running Overseas, you get to push your limits a lot, and this is on many levels, personal, interpersonal, and professional level. Um, but to push, your to push your limits, you kind of need to know them. And you also need to understand that sometimes it's good to push your limits, and sometimes it's good to take a step back, uh, especially when things are, are so, so different around you. I'll get into more details in each one of these. Uh, more personally, um, my the, the men, in terms of mental resilience was the big point that I worked on a lot. Um, the situation changes all the time overseas. You get information from many parts, prof tech chains, uh, your task force gen, your camp OC. What really helps is to take it day by day, try not to think too far ahead and whatever happened will happen. There's no reason to stress about uh, something that is is going to happen in six days because chances are in six days it'll the situation will be completely different so you'll deal with it in the appropriate time physical objectives self-explanatory what i would like to add here is you know careful not to fall into the two three works out today uh it's a trap we all fall into it in the beginning um but don't forget that working out is the strain on your body and you know sometimes so much is happening around you that Taking, taking it easy and just working out once a day is, is sufficient. Spiritual here, not in terms of you know beliefs, but it's more it's more about being thankful and grateful uh, for the small things. You know, on deployments, you're deprived of a bunch of small things, and you only realize that you're you miss these things when when you you don't have them around you. And 
<laughs> for myself it was avocados like i really miss avocados you know but uh then one day you just finish work and uh you receive this care package and your favorite miss vicky's flavor is there and this one was actually from captain Cho. so uh, thank you very much it was sent to both me and master corporal mcneil uh and it it it, it makes your day it makes your weeks uh sometimes and um you really learn to appreciate that and same same goes with the um coming back home and seeing my family on hlta for the first time after three months not seeing them it just you really value these moments afterwards and i feel like it kind of compares to what's going on with COVID right now. If we can make a COVID analogy, um, being confined and then deconfining now, we really appreciate these moments and obviously the much anticipated avocados. Um, there's a emotional support, family and friends are, you know, their support is key throughout the mission. But whether you like it or not, you'll miss important moments, you know, and uh, like, for example, I miss my uh, nephew's baptism. Uh, my brother here is holding me, FaceTiming with them on the picture. And I also missed my first Christmas party um, as a detachment commander. But, you know, it's, it's fine because you do get to spend other moments and great memories that you will develop with a bigger family this time, the military family overseas. Interpersonal. Now, this is interesting. Um, with, working with the coalition was, was, was just awesome. It's such a cultural experience on its own. And I think you learn so much by it. You almost feel like you visited each single country that is on, on base with you. You feel like you visited each one of them just because you worked with the locals from these countries on a regular basis for an extended period of time. So that I, I really embrace that. Um, adaptation, you need to adapt many times uh, interpersonally when you're about to deploy. You need to adapt prior, you need to adapt during, and you need to adapt after prior because you need to adapt to um, the, uh, the all your family and friends asking you the same questions all the time and excited to leave, but at the same time having this emotional separation that is about to happen and the goodbyes and the cries and all that. And then early on in, on deployment, you have to adapt to the fact that you have people around you all the time. You're never the me time is is gone. You don't you don't have this just you know focusing on yourself and uh, it almost makes it feel like you're always at work. And then post-deployment, you need to adapt again because those people that you got used to are not there anymore. So it gives you a sense of void. So um, when I got back, I had this, I, I was, I found myself constantly um, looking um, on, on group text and, and like looking at news in the Middle East, always talking to people over there. So it takes some time to disconnect and detach. All right, professionally, dentists uh, are healthcare professionals. And the reason why I stress this is because very early on in the mission, you know, with the events at the beginning of the year, we quickly realized that we were the only Canadian medical uh, personnel on camp. So we found ourselves in a position of relaying information from the task force gen liaison to our camp with the role two and the Cans of PA. It's very gratifying role and, and stressful at times, but with our military education and officership and background in dental medicine, I felt like we can stand to that role when needed. Uh, the next point, debrouillardise, resourcefulness. It's, I think it has to do with the pictures on the right. Uh, two, three days in um, on deployment, I had a patient that coming in with a broken 2-1 on a flipper. Um, sadly or luckily, I don't know, I found, I found that and I, it just, the thing is, you know the repair kit was also there but i haven't used that in years last time i used it was in first or second year of dentistry but you know you do what you got to do you're and i was able to fix it with that um and thankfully the patient didn't have to come back lastly uh on deployment you uh don't have the backup of specialists so this is great because it pushes you to do certain treatments uh, up to a certain point, but it should also um, stop you from doing other treatments where you know that you're not the you're not going to be able to provide this you know expertise, and it might be better for the patient to get the treatment done once he goes back home. Now I like this slide: dentist clinical readiness. Um, the points on the left: endodontics, surgery, operative dentistry, dental trauma. These are the things that you're. It's the bread and butter. This is what you do on a daily basis all the time. 
Um, but I really want to stress endodontics. Is I, I went there thinking surgery was going to be the, uh, the key discipline, but it, it was really endodontics. We got to do a lot of it. And, you know, we're no longer in an era of dentistry where extracting infected teeth is the norm. At this point, you should be comfortable providing alternative treatments to your uh, patients, even in deployed setting. I really like this graph um, because dentistry is a very humbling profession, you know, and you realize this the more you do of it and the more you expand your practice. Um, so in the field of psychology, the Dunning-Kruger effect is related to the cognitive bias that comes from the inability of people to recognize their lack of ability. This applies to us, <laughs> This applies to us in, in, in our journey to clinical expertise so much. You know, through dental school, we go through very rapid learning. We sometimes mix this rapid learning gain, by gaining confidence in the field when really our confidence and clinical autonomy comes from our clinicians and our demos behind us. And the minute we graduate, we hit that valley of despair that they call. And, um, you know, that valley of despair, uh, we start we, we start making our own first uh, autonomous decisions and first irreversible treatments without anyone around stepping in and taking responsibility for our acts but ourselves. So you realize then that you know you have so much more to learn and the mentorship program of the RCDC or just having a mentor around at that time is strongly helpful. Then comes the slope of enlightenment and it takes about a few years in you start being comfortable in certain disciplines You've pushed your limits in, a certain area, in certain areas and maybe have done a mistake or two from which you learned a lot. This is the perfect timing, by the way, to do the CFHTC courses. Um, by the way, I, I, I strongly recommend that before you do these clinical courses, um, to do enough clinical prior, just to, just to know, um, like, what, just to know uh, what can go wrong and to be able to troublesho troubleshoot and learn best from these um, specialists that will be around you. Uh, on those courses. Lastly, the plateau uh, of sustainability. This is when you reach the state of flow, things are less surprising clinically, outcomes, uh, outcomes are normally predictable, and at this point I think it's the right time for you to deploy. Now let's get into the fun stuff, clinical cases. In terms of surgery, we obviously saw a bunch of abscesses and cellulitis cases, Two things that I was impressed by. Uh, one is the one time that I needed uh, a drain, I found it finally. I found a drain and it was in Iraq and in, in the MDC. Uh, I, whenever you need a drain, you always ended up, end up using a rub, piece of rubber dam or a cut glove. Uh, but here in, in, in the MDC in Iraq, I found a, an actual drain. I thought it was pretty fancy. The other thing is um, extra oral and intraoral swellings are to be addressed and the, 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 uh, the problem is working there with the role two and non-dental professionals, uh, they tend to, not, I don't wanna say panic, but they, they take it very ser seriously the minute they, they see a swelling and uh, it was a ver very important discussion. We actually made a presentation to have with these um, colleagues to discuss what, what constitutes a medical emergency, what constitutes dental emergency, when yes, you do need to medevac the patient from such city to us, or when it can, the patient can just come in on a routine run so not to jeopardize an entire flight scene. One of the difficulties we had for oral surgery was not having a pen. So we really had to push our limits uh, in terms of periapicals. Master Corporal McNeil was really good with those. Um, thankfully we did because sometimes we got surprises and I was glad I visualized whatever I needed to visualize prior so that I can plan my procedure well and prepare the patient for possible risks. We talked about resourcefulness. The, this patient showed up, he came in with a perioendo lesion on tooth 1-1. One, one. Um, pus was coming out from a fistula on the interproximal papilla, tooth was necrotic and mobility too was observed. I, I remember that patient when he came in, um, like just talking, you could see the tooth moving. You'll notice that I didn't place any clamp on the tooth uh, while I did the endo and for obvious reasons. I used instead two wedges on adjacent teeth um, and he maintained it pretty stable for the entire length of the endo. After, afterwards, we, we uh, fixed the teeth and we raised the flap and removed the periapsis. And I know the prognosis of this is reserved, if not poor, but it's a temporary treatment. Tooth was preserved for now. 
Another alternative that was proposed to the patient was to extract the tooth, cut the coronal portion, and use it as a pontic. But the patient preferred to start with the first option, and I'm glad he did. You know what? I followed up on him for a few weeks, and the, and the abscess was gone, and he will have a frontal tooth at least for the length of his deployment. Some other cases you decide not to touch. This patient came in simply complaining of a bridge dismantling. Now, experience will tell you that when you have a bridge dismantling, especially if it's an old bridge, look for other things because something is off and you need to investigate more, see what, why is that bridge is now failing after so many years. Um, so this case, we took a PA and we realized how short the roots were. There's some sort of external root resorption and uh, I decided not to touch it. The patient was not in pain and I was not gonna be able to provide him for uh, better aesthetics had I not been able to put that bridge back. So um, again, this was one that I didn't touch and I felt like a prosthodontist would deal with it or his dentist back home would have better tools having a lab around. That's another case that uh, I would normally 100% send out uh, to an endodontist, but uh, you know, overseas the patient showed up with an extra oral buckle space swelling, and uh, while I really hoped that the 2.7 was the problem, it appeared that the it had to be the crowned and endotreated 2.6 that was the issue. So I discussed it with the patient, and yes, extraction was among the options. Uh, just because of the extent of the swelling, but you know, once the antibiotics took care of the bad bugs, he insisted on trying the retreatment before considering the extraction. The patient was also very concerned about his crown, so we elected to try and remove it instead of cutting it. But just in case it didn't work, I had made a putty instead, a putty just in case with a temp prepared. What's interesting about this case is that whatever came out of it seemed so odd. It looked like blue Teflon tape, and it kept coming out. My God, like this kept coming out. It wouldn't stop. Um, and um, like, I was so surprised because I was expecting some guta fricka to come out of there just because of the opacity. Um, I don't know if Ashley, you've seen this before, but I, um, it was the first time I see a Teflon tape inside the canals or it looks like it at least. Anyways, uh, completed the treatment, saw the patient in post-op and swelling was gone and uh, the patient was happy. So I think it went well. Um, just a quick point about retreatments. I don't, I don't, you know, just jump in uh, into retreatments. I, I think you're you're gonna appreciate what I mean by this case. I don't just jump in and 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 do them. I just I always want to make sure that I understand the cause of the the failing endo, and um, I need to make sure that I can do a better job than what was done. And these cases normally are the ones where I see some sort of coronal infiltration, where I feel like saliva and bacteria has done some part of my work already. Anyway, so this case on the 1.5, I thought it was interesting to see the difference between what a PA provides and what a bite wing provides. You can see that the uh, coronal structure on the, on the bite wing is a lot worse than what we see on the PA. So it's always good to have both views. On the bite wing, you can appreciate there's a post in there. On the PA, not so much. So both views are very complementary, and it was good to have. These posts, by the way, the, the, the ones that look like a screw, um, they could be intimidating to uh, remove sometimes. They're really easy to get out. Uh, you just, you know, unscrew counterclockwise. I hold it, I hold it with a hemostat, and, you know, you apply your classic lefty, loosey, righty, tidy, and it comes out pretty smoothly, and we completed the treatment, and it went well. Now, just a bunch of other cases. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail, just to say that this is the type of things we saw. First one on the left, uh, just to show that, you know, it's not because you're deployed that you don't look for EMB2s. We still look for the EMB2s whenever we got the chance to. Uh, upper right side, um, it's one of those cases that um, the mesio roots had no infection and they were perfectly sealed coronally. So we elected to only deal with the distal canal uh, that I re, uh, retreated. For some reason, the dentist was done that I feel like he just stopped midway. Um, anyway, anyways, uh, middle case, um, I just thought it was cool. I had this accessory canal and you know, you get excited every time you see it. And the last case on the lower right, um, I put it there because this is probably my least favorite. I tend to try to remove the crowns to do the endo and put them back in. Just because when you drill through a crown, uh, sometimes clinically I get it, you have to do it. But drilling through a crown, it's, it's a very lonely and dark world. 
So uh, you need to take your time. And um, once you find that white spot, it takes a while before it turns into a canal. And these canals are very sclerosed. So take your time. Um, I personally don't like these cases. And um, yeah, I just thought I would put it in there. These cases, aesthetics this time, um, it's not to show off you know, the, the end result, but really to show that there's a lot you can do without your 12 shades kit and the brush and stuff. You know, don't get me wrong. If I have these tools, I will use it. But we were taught in school that the eye forgives the color and not so much the shape. So focusing on the shape, going through a proper uh, polishing sequence, there's a lot you can do on deployments, even with an A3 and A2 uh, only in your tool toolkit. All right, so <laughs> um, this would be a rather boring presentation if I uh, if we only talked about um, a bunch of su successful cases. Uh, anyone with who practices long enough will get bad days, and this is one of them. So I put it there as a reminder reminder for myself and for you guys to never undermine any cases, especially on deployments when uh, you don't have any specialists around to um, kind of get your back. So this patient was sent to me from another dentist overseas and judging by the hematoma uh, that he had following an incision and drainage procedure, it didn't go quite well. I took a radiograph, a diagnosis of uh, necrotic one, two following previous trauma was made and it all seemed so, uh, it all seemed straightforward. Long root, though, when you look at the radiograph, 27 millimeters in total, and you can appreciate that small classic distal tip at the, at the apex of, the la of normal lateral uh, incisors. Rather quickly and easily, I accessed the canal, and uh, I had such a small opening uh, on the lingual, and I thought it was cute and conservative, and I just ended up not removing enough of the lingual dentinal triangle. Now, you probably see where I'm going with that, um, the dentinal triangle and the distal root tip um, made this S-shape torque, and the minute I put in a rotary file in two length, it just broke. So now, <laughs> now here I was in a not so great scenario. The patient is still in, is still swollen. He's it's an aesthetic tooth that I can't just remove, and the closest endodontist is in a different uh, country. To make it all better, this patient came in to see me after having a rather unpleasant experience with a previous dentist. This is a bad day at work. Anyways, it goes without saying that file had to come out, or at least I had to try. So like I said, we're well equipped in the, in the clinic, in the MDC, and we found an ultrasonic endotip. And since I could visualize the file still, I started wiggling it out and trying not to break that small tip that I could still visualize. And, um, after what felt like an eternity and 45 minutes later, the file finally came out. Probably by far the best feeling I had all deployment. So lesson learned, what was supposed to be a 30 minute pulpectomy ended up being a two hour long treatment. So please do not undermine any case, look for those sneaky curves and get rid of those dental triangles. And you know what? It's great to be conservative in terms of axis cavity. I always try to be. But sometimes, you know, being conservative won't ever uh, defy physics. And the end result is still very decent, but I did enlarge my access cavity to get rid of that file, and I could have done that from the get-go and saved myself and the patient a lot of trouble. All right. Um, in my first few years in the Army, I remember being at the mess and a bunch of friends casually asking each other the question, you know, what road were you on? Never really knew why that made such a difference, up to the point that I deployed on two separate rotations. Going back for a second time, I had a feeling of deja vu. I mean, I went uh, in September for a tab, and I was back in December for my own roto. So um, the initial excitement that you feel when you're about to deploy was gone the second time. Uh, <laughs> well, let me tell you, uh, little did I know I was about to live something completely different uh, from what I had experienced just a few months prior. So every rotation is so unique. I'll give you just a quick example, just because we have some time. My first experience on a Herx flight was just amazing. We were just under 10 people on the flight. Someone mentioned it. Uh, someone mentioned that it was a major, a major guy's like first time in a plane, and they uh, decided to put me in the cockpit with the pilots. It was just wonderful. 
Now, the second time I went uh, in December, January, uh, the second time I had to take a towel flight, I was stuck on that plane for 27 hours. I don't mind a towel flight for eight hours sitting like that, but 27 hours was something else. I'll spare the details why we ended up being uh, stuck there for so long and grounded there, but uh, it was definitely an interesting start for my rotation. So yeah, what I lived in September is completely different from what I lived in January, and I am absolutely uh, confident that it's completely different from what Zach is experiencing right now. Dental techs and dental assistants. So uh, I know there's some of you out there right now listening. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to uh, thank each and every single one of you guys. Um, I learned something from each one of you, and uh, especially the ones that I worked with, from Ma Madame Marie-France Paquet to uh, my current uh, Audrey Fortin, uh, my current assistant. Um, I'll, I'll skip all the ones that I worked with throughout, but you know, thank you so much for everything that you do. And there's uh, like the the quality care that we I provided and I provide on a daily basis is has a lot to do and it's directly related to your help. So thank you. Now on deployments, you get to develop a very strong bond with your dental tech. And that relationship uh, you have with your dental assistant is very particular and need to be handled with care, trust, and delicacy. You're literally together all the time. It's by far the most important relationship that you'll ever develop on deployment. Uh, it's important that you take care of each other. It can be delicate at times, but with communications and respect, it just becomes a beautiful thing. And I'm very thankful that I had Master Corporal McNeil. And, you know, on top of being great at her work, she was also a great friend. In summary, um, deploy. It's a great opportunity to serve your country. Um, it's a, you know, for, for a lot of us in the RCDC, it's a once in a lifetime experience that you could live. Not a lot of us will get to deploy a second time and, uh, and even less a third time. And it's also a great opportunity for us to train as we fight. You know, we spend so much time developing and training for um, deployments that it's nice to finally live it. Sadly, my time was cut short by the virus, uh, but uh, luckily I had a great colleague to take over and deal with all the changes, which he will now discuss with you. So Captain Zeeler, um, I hand this on to you. Captain Zeeler. Hey, Andrew, thank hey, you so much. We're just waiting for uh, him to come back on. That was a great, I love to, uh, I'm just going to ask you, make a couple comments. I love to see, uh, you know, it takes a lot of courage to show a couple of your, you know, a couple of mistakes. Lucky you're able to turn that back around with that broken file. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. No problem. <laughs> it wasn't so great at the time. Yeah, it's all good. Let's just see here. So if everybody can, uh, if everybody can just hold tight for a minute, we had this working. Sherry Bork can actually attest to that because we had this working. Oh, there we go. Yeah. All right, Zach, are you on the landline? Or are you trying to do this through the t through the computer? Landline. All right, search for you. I think you were number three. Uh, just go ahead and give it a shot again. Really excited to have you yourself, uh, Master Corporal McNeil and Captain Zyler, straight from uh, Op Impact. So what's really interesting is yesterday when we rehearsed this, we tried the computer, we tried the burner phone, 
Then we tried the landline. I don't know what's next. I think we're all going to have to get on an airplane. We'll see you. So I appreciate your patience, everybody. We're just going to give it another minute here. Lines drop sometimes. He's got old school phone in his hand. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I think that means you're dialing in. So if you're still listening, I really appreciate your time. One of the questions that Captain Cho had asked me, uh, she'd asked me about um, the anesthesia, advanced anesthesia lectures from Major Carrier and actually what he wanted them unlisted, which is uh, because he had some images in there. So what I'm gonna do is I'll send out another email. You can't find them on the replays. There's a replay email. So if they're not on, you can't see them on YouTube, but I will send them out via um, email with the link in it. And if you have an opportunity, if people are asking you, you know, how do I get onto these webinars and whatnot, just go straight to the website, vcr.1. The whole point of that is to have the same one place with all the information and the schedule and the PPE. Oh. There we go. Can you hear us? Hey. Can you hear us? <laughs> <laughs> You go. Just a, a little taste of the excellent calms that we sometimes <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> All right, guys, great to hear from yeah, you. That was weird. All yours. All right. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Major Gaia, for the introduction. Uh, greetings from sunny Herbal, Iraq. I'm Captain Zeeler. And I am Master Corporal McNeil. And uh, welcome to COVID and the operational environment. So uh, today we're going to walk you through a little bit of what we've experienced down here uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and we'll start off with just a little bit of background and context for where we are, uh, how COVID's affected the country and the surrounding countries and how that plays into our environment. Then we'll get into a little bit of um, a sit rep for what life at the dental clinic is like now, what kind of patients we see, what kind of procedures we perform. Uh, and then we'll get into sort of the meat and potatoes of the presentation, which is the, uh, we're going to walk through a case presentation more as a, uh, as a springboard into a discussion about all the little things that we've had to change along the way in patient care. Uh, some of the challenges that we've come up against implementing the, uh, COVID protocols in this environment and some of the solutions we've kind of MacGyvered along the way to make it work. So, uh, and then we'll just tie things off with a little bit of a conclusion. We'll talk about some of the clinical dilemmas that we've had down here and, uh, and look at future directions for deployed dentistry. All right, take her away. So I'm going to tell you about the um, country of Iraq, where we're currently at in Erbil. It's located in the region of northern Iraq. The population is approximately 879,000 people. Um, the city has been on and off for partial and complete lockdown since March. And the civilian airport right now is tentatively scheduled to reopen on the 7th of June. And Erbil borders the Iran, Turkey, and Syria. Right now, there's approximately 300 contractors moving on and off the base here at Erbil daily. So right now, the, for COVID statistics in our area in Erbil, their total cases has been 281, which 228 have recovered. And there's 52 ongoing, which six are in critical condition, and there's been reported as one death. The highest single day increase in new cases has been recorded on 31st of May, which has been 101. So uh, that kind of paints the picture of, of, 
uh, the area that we're in and specifically the city. And so you can kind of see everyone's been holding their breath for COVID to come uh, onto base for almost three months now. And we've yet to actually see a case, knock on wood. But because of the degree of movement on and off the base through the contractors, it's still very much a possibility. And when we look at these graphs, Iraq is still on the, uh, the upswing of their curve. Now, being in northern Iraq, we immediately uh, border Iran, Turkey, and Syria. And so you can see those countries have their own uh, kind of struggles going on. Iran, as we know, was hit fairly hard early on then hit a bit of a period of recovery and seems to be in the midst of a second wave. Turkey's faring a little better. It does seem like they're on the down downward end of their curve. Syria is more up for grabs. With 123 cases, that may suggest that it's more an issue with testing than it is actually indicative of what the situation is there. And, uh, and our neighbors at, uh, on the base in Kuwait are, are still kind of seeing the, the peak of their uh, COVID cases. Saudi Arabia, similarly, relatively high. And so now we'll tell you a little bit about uh, what our life doing uh, dental work is like down here. And a lot of it, uh, Major Guy had started to touch on. So you'll kind of get a feel for what's, uh, what's the same and what's changed since uh, in the last couple of months. So we have a patient population down here of around 4,500, which includes um, the military from 15 countries, uh, the coalition, which is uh, the Italians, the French, the Finnish, uh, the Germans, the Hungarians. We also see U.S. civilian contractors for emergency care. We see Department of State. Um, and we also treat uh, incoming forces that come in from northern Iraq, from Mosul, uh, Kirkuk. Manila and beyond, Syria and Taji. Um, there's also uh, two other dental assets of, that are in the JOA. One is in uh, the Roll 3 in Baghdad, but often it's hard to get uh, patients in there as sometimes they're in the black and they're not able to fly in. And also there's the Roll 3 in Kuwait. Yeah, so that picture in the in the corner was from uh, slightly better days in the, er the early parts of uh, my tab that's that's all, it's still ongoing to this day. Um, but uh, take a take a peek and see, it, you know, see if you see anything there that may not work as well when uh, you're going to be treating patients in a in a COVID environment. So there's a couple things that that was what we were wearing in the early stages, but we did make some changes later on uh, with the new guidelines because of we thought could be an issue. So as the uh, statistics show, we were treating um, roughly 20 patients uh, per week uh, up until March 30th. Um, it declined when the start of COVID came, and we uh, since then have been treating still roughly 9 to 10 patients per week as the uh, graph shows. Yeah, so we're still a relatively popular spot. Um, in terms of the procedures that we're doing, uh, the, that 10 probably breaks down into four or five high-risk patients a week and four or five uh, low-risk patients. So as you can see, this is a bit of a busy table, but we're, all, we're just trying to draw attention to the fact that oral surgery and endodontics are largely unchanged pre- and, and post-COVID precautions because these are the true emergencies. They're not the ones that are getting triaged and sent away. They're still the patients we're seeing. Um, and those are the ones that are largely contributing to those aerosol generating procedures. Uh, and then restorative still does make up a, a large bulk of what we do, although the numbers have dropped. Um, and what we're doing now is more in the realm of uh, temporary filling. So less definitive restorations being placed, but it's still, we end up doing quite a bit. So, a lot can happen in a very short amount of time, as we found out. Uh, so this is a bit of a timeline of some of the major events that hit. March, as you're going to find out, was a, a busy month. It seemed like almost on a daily basis things were changing down here, um, and we were having to adapt very quickly to our situation as well as the guidelines and, and guidance that we were receiving from higher. 
So uh, the first first sign of trouble uh, was when Major Guyad flight got canceled. So that's not on here, but that was the kind of the first rumbling that things were going to get shut down and that the, things were going to get increasingly more restricted in this area. By the 12th of March, uh, we received a no movement order for off impact and the borders had been closed between Iraq and Kuwait. On the 17th of March, uh, the air airport closes and the city is on lockdown and implemented and that meant that all dental clinics outside the city are uh, in the city sorry were closed so we got very popular very quickly because uh contractors who would normally go out into town for their care not just on base here but even uh in syria they would come to Erbil to see civilian dentists uh no longer had any options so some of those because of the fact they weren't emergency were getting turned away but uh we were getting a lot more people showing up at our door once civilian dental clinics in the area weren't an option anymore. Um, so around that time, uh, the CDC, the WHO, started releasing guidelines of what healthcare providers should be wearing. Dentistry hadn't really formalized recommendations. So at that point, uh, in conjunction with advice from the role two, we started implementing N95 masks for patients on the 21st of March. Uh, we started wearing gowns and uh, and the face shield sometimes on top of those N95 masks. But uh, at this point, for a couple of days, because PPE was scarce, we were uh, reusing masks in between patients. So we would hang them up in between patients as long as they weren't visibly uh, soiled or saturated. And on the 23rd of March, uh, we were just uh, strictly to emergency and urgent care only. And we were told at that point too that the N95s were disposed of after each use. Uh, the 27th of March will forever be known as the TSN turning point <laughs> in, uh, in the way we treated patients down here because that's the day that the RCBC uh, communique came out that had all of the guidelines differentiating patients into high risk, low risk, the PPE for each, uh, infection control, cool down procedures of three hours. Um, and so to paint the picture, we had started with these kind of humble beginnings of trying to up our PPE past the, you know, scrub top and combat pants basically that we were wearing prior. Um, and now we had a huge need for a ton of PPE very quickly. Uh, and, you know, as we were kind of getting at, we're a popular spot, even turning people away as much as we could, you're still seeing about nine or 10 patients a week. And on top of that, the, our sources of PPE were like, this was never an environment that was meant to sustain this level of PPE, or at least, you know, previous rotos weren't stocking that because then 95 masks weren't routinely used. So, uh, but at the same time, the role two who was providing us the, that PPE was starting to take a look at their own stocks and realizing that if COVID takes off, they are probably uh, unequipped. And so there was a mad scramble to get PPE on both sides um, for both uses um, into theater, which obviously comes with its own challenges. So on April 8th, um, that was another scramble to Iraq, uh, where Canada relocates most of its assets out of Iraq, which meant that 250 people were taken out and back to Kuwait. Um, there was the six uh, Griffin helicopters were removed from Iraq as well, and they removed uh, 519,000 pounds of cargo as well out of Iraq and surrounding areas and seven aircraft pallets. So all this to say that um while we were in the midst of adapting these protocols to patient care and trying to secure enough PPE to survive the next couple of weeks, let alone rotos, um, we were also contending with the fact that there was a lot of moving pieces going on in and around the, uh, the camp as well with uh, Canada relocating their assets. So as a, as a sort of side project, we had um, to work at reestablishing some of the support network that Dental had down here um, and looking to reach out to find new contacts and new people to fill the roles that were previously filled by people in country. Um, after that, uh, you know, we finally kind of hit a rhythm, hit a groove for a little while. And around 12 May, the city of Erbil had stopped reporting new cases for a little while. So they started to ease their uh, lockdown restrictions. And on the 
the 23rd of May, uh, Ramadan ends. And then following that, June 1st, we have uh, new cases begin to rise in the city of Erbil. So we are locked down for another six days, and that brings us to present. All right. So that kind of that kind of paints the picture is, is that uh, the local city is still on the uptick as far as COVID cases go. And, you know, knock on wood, we get to see one on base. But the possibility is still very real, and we've been holding our, our breath for a while. The, the base has implemented measures like social distancing at the dining facilities. You take your food to, to go. The reason we're wearing these bandanas is it's, it's now mandatory to have face coverings in certain areas like the, uh, the PX store or uh, when you're going into the cafeteria. So a, a lot's changed, and now we'll kind of walk you through a bit of a day in the life of patient care to show you how that's impacted our uh, our care. So uh, most of this case is, is true. Uh, some of the details have been fudged. That individual that's in the picture there pointing to his uh, tooth is a professional model um, from the role two uh, that has agreed to have his image used here. So he's not actually the guy with the toothache, but um, so, uh, one day, a 28-year-old American male knocks on the door to the SEV, and he's complaining that it hurts to drink hot liquids. Now, his tooth got a bit of a story to it. Uh, once upon a time, it had a root canal performed and a crown place, but he said that wasn't successful and it had caused him pain. So in February, the, the crown was uh, reaccessed. The tooth had a retreatment performed, and he was left with a temporary filling. So... Uh, in the last couple of days, it's now started uh, hurting again, and it hurts to chew and, and with hot liquids. So, uh, like Major Guy had aptly pointed out, when you when you look at uh, a tooth and you're evaluating whether or not this is going to be a retreatment case, especially in this case, was potentially going to be the third retreatment on this tooth through a crown, which we all know is a, a bit of a project. We want to make sure that we feel like we can actually improve on on the work that's come before. So. There's a couple reasons why this may have uh, be causing issues. First of all, it looks like it's cavit in the access cavity, which as we know, if that's been since February, that's a long time for that temporary filling to be there. So it could be reinfected. The mesial uh, buckle and distal buckle roots is a little bit short filled maybe, but we're also could be missing that NB2 with it being a first molar. So, that brings us to our first challenge. So back home, with everyone being at home, uh, phone call triage is kind of the default. Uh, it's people have to call. You, you're automatically given that physical distancing between you and the patient uh, in your triage um, encounter. Unfortunately here, that's difficult because our computers, or at least Master Girl McNeil's, is in the SEV itself. And patients are definitely not shy about barging right on into the SEV to say hello. So, uh, they, you know, that's, that's an individual that could potentially be contaminating the SEV if they were shedding virus. Um, and or if we were in the middle of treatment and we were generating aerosols, that's also a threat potentially to the person who's just about to walk into that environment. So. We had to uh, adapt our signage at the front. That says, do not enter the dental clinic unless you are asked to. Uh, please knock, use hand sanitizer, take a mask, and step back to the line or have a seat in the reception area. So from these pictures, you can see uh, this individual, he knocks and he steps back to the line. And so now he can have a conversation with the dental tech who can perform uh, some triage and kind of feel for for what kind of uh, work he might need. Is this gonna be a high risk procedure? Is this gonna be a low risk procedure? What PPE will we need to treat this uh, gentleman? And so he takes the seat and he fills out his medical history. All right, so it's time to get suited up for battle here and, uh, and start treating this patient. But we have our next challenge and that's that what we've been wearing previously does potentially have some issues to adapt to the protocols that we're trying to put in place. So the first issue is the facial hair. Uh, the beard on Captain Beeler is not gonna fly with an N95 mask. As we know, uh, these masks are only as good as the seal you're able to create, and having that scruff is, is not gonna work. Um, the combat pants and the combat boots may also be problematic. So 
we're wearing gowns, but a lot of the time that gown doesn't completely cover your legs. And those combat pants and boots are being worn back home, uh, potentially with viral particles on them or, or aerosols on them. Uh, and while we do have shoe covers for the, the shoes, they don't fit over the entirety of the boots, but you've got shoelaces that are potentially getting contaminated. Um, and, and so that, that has some issues. And why does it matter? Well, uh, Gao et al. found when they swab different areas in hospitals in Wuhan, that 50% of the hospital workers that they were swabbing uh, tested positive on their shoes for COVID. So they found that uh, shoes were a major uh, source of tracking COVID out of the areas um, where the patients were, and they were finding it in rooms that those patients had never been in because of the fact it was leaving on the shoes. Uh, they, they also found that, you know, computer mice were high risk areas. And so we now bag our keyboard and, and put uh, a saran wrap over those areas, um, as well as garbage bins, which we'll kind of circle back to a little bit later. But they also found when they sampled uh, the air in the area that it could be up to four meters, uh, even upstream of where the patients were. So if you think about that, Sev, there's almost nowhere that's four meters away from where the patient is. So theoretically, the whole of the Sev could get contaminated, almost every surface. Um, so uh, we did our research, uh, we pulled up the CDC guidelines on facial hair and we scoured the uh, literature and we finally settled on the, uh, the painter's brush or the chevron as being a suitable form of facial hair for a head 95 mask while still maintaining the authority that facial hair uh, gives you. I, I often look quite young without it. Again, is a bit short on their own. Uh, and, Amazon. Yeah, a Amazon, uh, ever the reliable friend down here. We, uh, <laughs> we did end up getting some scrub pants of our own. Zach, Zach, uh, just, uh, we, lost you. we lost you for a minute. If you want to start over that slide, the work dress challenge two, we lost you for uh, a good uh, 30 seconds. Oh, OK. Um, did, did we get the mustache bit in there? We, we got the mustache. No worries, no worries. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Just, just <laughs> <All right. checking. laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, that brings us to our work dress. We basically went back to what we've worn in Canada, which is designated scrub pants, designated clinic shoes, which is not reinventing the wheel, but uh, that does come with its own challenges because of the fact that there were no scrub pants down here. Um, and all of a sudden in a hurry, we needed to change the way we were dressing. So Ever the trusty friend, we, um, we got Amazon to, we to send us some scrubs in addition to borrowing what we could from the role who was kind of short on their own uh, scrubs. And uh, we had to go to the PX, uh, Master Corporal McNeil bought some new shoes and we're hoping that, uh, that that's still within her budget for, uh, for boots for the year. So our, our heroes uh, don their PPE in the his and her uh, custom mirrors, that magnetized mirrors that are placed in the SEV there next to the CDC guidelines, which brings us to our next challenge. So when we first uh, were told about the new uh, PPEs, our initial supplies on the 27th of March, as you can see, are very limited. Um, in theater, we had our N95 masks. We only had 20. For the level one, two gowns, we had three. Uh, for the level three, four gowns, we had two. And for surgical gloves, um, we had 122 pairs of size seven and size seven and a half. And the level three mask with the face shield, we had 20. No bonnet and no shoe cover. So to um, help to with the challenge of this, uh, we definitely, as you can see, we borrow from the roll two. Uh, Kuwait, they had very limited supplies to begin with of the N95 masks. Uh, 
uh, so they weren't able to send us a lot. Um, in our warehouse back at camp, we found uh, some N95 masks as well as the white coveralls. Uh, you see us uh, wiping down our MDC in. Um, so they came in during the pack up of the camp from Taji. So they found them when the people were packing up the camp, the supply packs were here. They were giving us whatever they found in those tea containers that came in from other areas, from Q West and from Taji. So we were lucky to have those. So we also have ordered in the meantime our supplies through Canada, but it takes a while, which is usually six to seven weeks to get any supplies down here. So and the low risk procedures we only had as a single provider. Yeah, so that was that was just kind of one other strategy that we had that if uh, we can do a temporary resto where it's just the dental officer and the sev that cuts your PPE in half for that procedure. So Master Gold McNeil would set up and kind of hang out outside the sev, and I'd haul her if I if I was uh, stuck with something or I needed her to to um, put on PPE and come in. But generally, certain procedures like consults and temporary filling, we we're trying to do with uh, one person to cut back on that PPE use. Uh, which brings us to the next challenge. So, uh, as you can see, probably imagine we're burning through a lot of PPE, um, and uh, and a lot of it's consumable in the early phases. Um, we had disposable face sh shields, uh, bonnets, um, shoe covers, gowns, you name it. Almost everything we were wearing went in the trash after every appointment. And not only do we have to sustain ourselves right now for the emergency care, but theoretically, uh, we need to be well enough equipped for future rotations for the day that we go back to providing non-urgent care, which is just going to consume even more of it. So uh, on top of that, as Major Guy can probably uh, attest to, you know, sometimes it's tough to even get the lidocaine that you ordered in the right amount down here. And now we had, uh, you know, six or seven items that we were trying to get. Uh, into theater, which was delayed, but also in high demand throughout the globe. So uh, it was definitely challenging to get stuff down here. And uh, this next slide kind of shows just how much PPE we would end up using in a week. Um, I won't go through the specifics. Gowns there, level one and two, have been grouped in with the level three and four. But you can see when you do a high risk procedure, you're actually consuming four gowns because you need your level three or four for the procedure itself. But then you're coming back three hours later with a level one or two, two sets of level one and two gowns to do the wipe down. And uh, on the next slide, you'll you'll just kind of see a picture there of just how much uh, PPE goes into every procedure. Um, so anytime that we could switch to something that could be reused was a huge bonus for our sustainability down here. It meant we could take that item almost off, you know, we can still order it, but it's less urgent if it's not coming right away. So plastic face shields, we were able to get through the Cansoft uh, medical officer down here. Uh, reusable surgical gowns from the roll, so we transitioned to those pretty quickly because they can be laundered. And then uh, there was some discussion back and forth with the COVID task force on switching out for cloth surgical caps. So. I was looked into the literature on this a little bit and realized I opened up a giant can of worms. Apparently this is highly controversial um, and uh, there's, there's quite a battle to legitimize cloth surgical caps against the bouffant cap. And I would say from what I found, there does seem to be evidence that both in terms of what you're keeping out of your hair, like the permeability from the outside world getting into your hair, and from the bacteria or particles that you would be shedding from your hair into the surgical field. I would argue that cloth surgical caps are at least equivalent to the disposable bouffant caps, if not maybe superior. As you can see in the picture, uh, Captain Zeeler is, uh, for his surgical cap, is rocking a nice unicorn uh, that has been blown to us from the roll two. Um, as we did not have any bouffants at the time when we were starting to uh, ramp up for all our PPE that we required down here. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've, I've certainly learned to love the unicorn skull cap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now that we've put on our spacesuits and are ready to do treatment, there is an adapt 
uh, adaptation period to wearing all this and doing dentistry. And sometimes in this environment, very challenging dentistry, like retreatments through crowns. Um, and I grew up in a generation that has never known a life without loops. Uh, and so it was going to be very difficult when we were doing one to two endos a week to be finding MB2 with just by eyes and no light. So we had to kind of get creative a little bit. You'll see um, we've modified the goggles with a, uh, a membrane made out of uh, a saline bag <laughs> that, uh, that kind of wraps around the loop. That way, allowing the user to get a, a relatively close to seal with the goggles around the face while still being able to use their loops underneath. And then the light from the loop is then clipped on top of the um, welder style face shield. Oh, oh, yeah, go ahead. So the retreatment is performed and the final restoration is placed. And so now that we're not doing follow up, we um, check in with the patient uh, one week later or we uh, give them a phone call to follow up and then they report on their symptoms. And that's another change too is in, in uh, previous days, we would bring people back for follow up appointments. A lot more of it's done over the phone now, unless that it's something that absolutely requires us to have eyes on, um, because of the fact that just it's one less use of PPE. And uh, and when you have that three hour cool down period, it really does limit the amount of patients you're able to see in your day as well. So sometimes we are doing a little bit of triage that way. If there's an emergency that's priority, maybe we can do a phone call follow up and save that appointment slot. Uh, so, uh, our heroes doff their PPE and perform hand hygiene. As you can see there, that's, uh, the protocols do call for a, um, uh, hands-free garbage. And so that's a custom broomstick that's been jammed through there. And, uh, with a little practice, you can usually hook an elbow onto that and open up the, the garbage bin without touching it. Um, and then the reusable PPE goes in the bin next door. And just out of pure luck, the Roll 2 set up a shower and sink facility right across from where we're located so we can walk outside of the SEV and do our hand hygiene and doff our PPE outside the SEV. So our enclosed environment makes it possible to contaminate nearly every surface. Um, COVID-19 can survive on plastic and stainless steel for up to three days, and aerosols can remain airborne for three hours. So after we finish a treatment, um, we uh, lock up the MDC and we leave for three hours uh, to let all the aerosols settle. Mm -hmm. All right, so for this next part, uh, this is sort of our, our big finale here. We have prepared a video for you. Uh, Major Guy, can I ask you to put the link into the group chat? If not, I can try and do that here. Uh, you want me to play it, Zach, right? I'm playing it right now. Oh, Am I? Oh, can, I was actually going to say it might be easier if we put the OneDrive link in just so they um, can uh, open it on their own system so it doesn't, uh, it, it's not too choppy. Right on. Okay. Well, uh, can you can you send the link or can someone put the link? Sure. Yeah. Right. I, I, th I, think, uh, I think Ashley did. Yeah, I just sent it out for you guys. So it, I okay. just it's unlisted on YouTube. Perfect. <laughs> it's unlisted. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I guess we're already going viral with this. Uh, so uh, we did want to prepare a little something here because I know watching us wipe down this entire sev is not the uh, most exciting part of your day. So we did inject a little production value into it for you. Enjoy. And we'll give you a minute to let that play. Now, I guess I, I hope that I listed the right email or the right YouTube video. Hey, Zach, while we're uh, sitting here waiting for people to watch, one of the questions that came from uh, Jesse Barker, Barker 
is have you guys had an opportunity to measure the air exchange per hour in the SEV? Uh, we have not. Unfortunately, uh, that that equipment isn't available to us at this point. The the one mitigating factor that is coming our way is uh, we're getting medevac units with HEPA filters uh, that are already on the way and have been ordered. So hopefully within the next month or so, we're going to have the means to uh, to actually start pulling aerosols out of the air and and maybe phasing out of the three hour cool down period. So no, we, we don't have that information or we haven't had the opportunity to measure that. All right, that's cool. So I think you can probably keep going. It's a great presentation. Okay. All right. Well, uh, definitely give that uh, give that video a watch. And if anyone wants to see it in the uh, Ultra HD 4K that it was originally shot in, uh, uh, shoot me an email, and uh, and we can probably look at uploading that to the uh, to the OneDrive link. Um, but just a just a little something to show. Yes, uh, we actually do that, and yes, it is done four to five times a week after aerosol generating procedures. Um, we don't necessarily wear those painters coveralls anymore. That was kind of an early stage adaptation. We subbed out for the level one gown because of what we had on hand. But for the video, it does kind of add a little drama to it and uh, give us kind of a breaking bad vibe for the whole thing. So, so we we uh, hyped it up a little bit. But essentially what we do is we, we do spray every surface from the ceiling downwards with a uh, the CDC's recommended one in 10 bleach solution leave it in place for a minute and wipe it. And then that's in addition to the normal wipe down procedures that uh, we would do in the operatory. Um, so in that video, you're gonna see us uh, wiping the surfaces, but also bringing in that bucket of reusable PPE, wiping down the, uh, the, the counter to create a clean space and then transferring the clean uh, wipe down PPE to that space. And then eventually it gets put away after we've doffed our PPE and exchanged the COVID, COVID elbow, which is uh, what's subbing in for a high five down here these days. Um, so just a couple of food for thought questions to wrap things up here for clinical dilemmas. Um, the guidelines call for a pulpectomy as far as root canal procedures go, which is definitely is a lot quicker than, than doing a start to finish root canal treatment um, and, and theoretically you know, less aerosol exposure but you do run into an issue that way in that a lot of people are stuck down here for, you know, six months at a time with us being the only dental care they're able to receive. So you can get calcium hydroxide in there, but are you going to run into another emergency in that six months when they come back reinfected? So sometimes judgment calls have to be made if they're headed home soon, you know, within a month to a month and a half, maybe that's not such a big deal. But if, uh, if they're going to be here for a long time, sometimes we will book them back if we've seen resolution of their symptoms and success for alteration because that's PP we may be spending either way down the line. Um, the other thing that uh, we haven't had to do down here, but it's, it's been on my mind, is we do a lot of temporary fillings and one provider temporary fillings, isolation isn't always perfect. So if we ran into the situation where our temporary fillings are failing early in a six month period, should we be spending that high risk PPE to perform, generate the aerosols and just perform the definitive restoration rather than spending low risk after low risk after low risk to maybe put temporary fillings back in over and over and over again. Um, all of that's likely to change with the new guidelines that have come out in the new equipment that we're getting, but it's, it's something that we've had to consider. Um, our crown re-cementation is a priority. Uh, what if they're not symptomatic? How quickly could that turn into an issue? Maybe if it's ideal circumstances that you could spend one set of low-risk PPE and re-cement to try and avoid a future problem, but it does become more of a production if all of a sudden that crown has super erupted from not having, or that tooth super erupted from not having the crown on it. Now we need a bite adjustment. That's not going to be viable with a carver anymore. So we just turned this into a high risk procedure. Is the juice still worth the squeeze in that case? Um, and then 
Finally, what priority, if any, should be given to loose implants in the triage? Um, you know, sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's just annoying. Sometimes it stops people from eating. Uh, in one particular case, we actually got lucky and we were able to just use low-level PPE because we waited for it to fall out. Um, and so at that point, we don't have to drill through a, uh, a screw access in a patient's mouth. We can take the crown uh, and screw, disinfect it um, using regular PPE, get to the screw access, then bring the patient in with low-level PPE and screw it back into place. Um, so it's just kind of, you know, I'm not saying it's, that we're doing it the right way with any of these things. They're just things we've had to consider and to try judgment calls we've had to make when adapting this in, uh, these guidelines to this environment. So for future directions, um, as you can see from this picture, the PATR uh, implementation with that machine has just arrived this past week to us. and. Um, we have just placed the order for the medevac units that, with the help of Bissler, are coming to us. Um, and Canada has been very good um, with our pharma in Kuwait with uh, providing us now with our PPE equipment, I believe. And I feel that now we are having a good stock of supplies on hand. And it's been coming quite quickly instead of the six to eight weeks. Um, I feel like we're getting more of a four-week rotation on our supplies coming. And so I think in the next maybe week or so, we'll be returning maybe to uh, for non-urgent care. And that brings us to the end. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah, thanks. I mean, thank you so much to uh, Major Guyad in uh, Bagotville and yourselves uh, over on uh, Op Impact, Master Corporal McNeil and Captain Zyler. Like it's an incredible presentation. We're super grateful for you folks. We're just going to give it a couple minutes uh, for some questions. You're right. And then, um, so Kim Kim Cleave says uh, thanks for sharing how you modified your PPE to accommodate the loops. I like that. that was that was actually pretty uh, pretty neat. Uh, Jesse Barker asks, what's the noise level like at the clinic, in camp, and at the shacks? <laughs> um, so the clinic is. It's not bad. Uh, you know, there's a general hum of, of kind of generators and equipment at all times. But when you, the, you're in the sev and the door shut, it's, it's, it, you don't really notice it, um, especially if you've got your uh, happy hit Spotify playlist playing or maybe an 80s playlist. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's, I wouldn't say it's overly noticeable. The, the camp is pretty good for the most part, but this is an air base uh, is all I would Say about that. So you're gonna uh, helicopters and, and planes are, are definitely a, a thing. Fine. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You kind of you kind of <laughs> you kind of just block the noise out most nights. I put earplugs in. Yeah, to I, to sleep. I wouldn't say it's uh, affected my ability to sleep no. at night. Significantly. You get used to it. it yeah. Calms you and puts you to sleep Please. now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's. Awesome. So another question uh, I was going to ask before was from uh, Darcy Cormier. How long does it take to completely wipe down the SEV unit? Well, actually not SEV because that's old school. The, uh, the Mobile Dental Clinic, wiping ceilings and walls. Uh, so that video, if you uh, like, times out to 17 minutes of real time footage there, and we are basically done. That is like, that was for like, we, we were wiping down after a patient and filmed it. So that, that is kind of real time. It wasn't always the way. The first couple run throughs were a half hour or so. Like a, we yeah, kind of got it down, down to that from getting more efficient and you know, you get your pattern of which panels on the wall you like to spray first and, and kind of go from there. But so, and we kind of split the MDC in half. Um, Captain Dealer, uh, cleans one half of it, and then I clean the other half. So it kind of cuts down on the whole total time of actually cleaning the MDC. Yeah, it's, it definitely became a two-player game uh, right from the outset. I, it would have been madness to to have a uh, dental tech by themselves doing that. So it was divide and conquer has, has definitely worked for us. 
And uh, Jesse just mentioned here, Jesse Barker, that uh, just as a reminder, SEV, which I totally forgot what it actually meant for, was Special Equipment Vehicle, and the MDC it now is called that because it's a mobile dental clinic. Um, so we'll just give another right. minute for any questions. What's the weather like in Iraq right now? The weather is approximately 38 degrees every day and on the up. It's hot. <laughs> the dry hot. Yeah. It's uh, so we have two air conditioning units going in the uh, in the set to keep me cool with the fan off to kind of minimize the blowing around of, of particles and aerosols. But it's uh, especially when you when you put on the spacesuit, it, it would be really really hot in there with us. I'm sure it would be super hot. Okay, don't. Uh, any Myrna Kinslow asks, do you have any issues with this? Is a great question because uh, I've experienced it. Any <laughs> glasses? Well, um, I wear glasses well, when we first um, started using the all the PPE, um, my goggles fogged up all the time, so I ended up mostly wearing my own um, my own glasses with the goggles over top, then with the face shield. But then it can't kind of change that we only have to wear the safety goggles with the face shield. So now I do not find that they um, fog up at all for my for me. Yeah, I would I would kind of echo that. I think in early early days uh, there was more fogging just because we were so unfamiliar with this PPE and we were putting it all on at once. And so even just the way your loops rest on it and then the goggles on top of the loops, if you don't have it just so you definitely do get some some fogging and that can be highly uh -huh. uh, highly frustrating when you know you can't be touching PPE to adjust it once it's on um so you know just, you're kind of uh most times now that when we put the masks on we usually have imprints because uh we're making sure they're so there's such a great seal that um that we usually have the imprints of the goggles and well as well as the mask when we take them off our faces at the end of the procedure yeah I would say the fogging has gotten better though. As you get more comfortable, it's just like when the first time you were putting on, you know, your dental mask at the beginning of your, your dental training, like, you, you know, it probably sat weird, it probably fogged more, but yeah, you do get used to it. I don't find it a huge issue anymore. Yeah, fogging can be actually quite frustrating issue. I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, thank you so much for that answer. Um, you know, there are, you know, over the past, that MDC has been there for a while. Have you, has there been any sand problems or the causing, sand causing any problems with the MDC over the past uh, several years? Um, our, uh, I mean, our sun shelter is, is kind of and nearing the end of its uh, lifespan a little bit. Like there are holes starting to show up in that, but the sand in the, the uh, MDC itself, not particularly. No, um, we also have a BMET tech that comes down and does regular maintenance for us on the MDC. So he's down here quarterly checking uh, all the equipment and the functioning of the MDC for us. Well, that's, I mean, that's pretty impressive, actually, that uh, technology that we've created. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we're going to find out with the last question here. And uh, I think one of the questions, well, one of the questions, do you, do you, did you, do you have to drape the patient for aerosol genning procedures, or is that, quite frankly, a waste of PPE at the moment? Uh, it is in the guidelines to to drape the the patient because of the fact that you know it, it potentially they're leaving with it on their clothes. Um, we're kind of at a spot now where we're a bit more comfortable with how much PPE we have. It's a, we've kind of hit a place of sustainability, so I don't know if I. I would say it's a waste. In the early days, that probably would have been way more of a concern. But sometimes that drape comes in the form of the we'll use the um, those green towels that uh, like the surgical towels that can be laundered. Um, so again, then you're not having to to use something that's disposable. Or if it's going to be an endodontic procedure where we're kind of uh, expecting multiple radiographs, we'll use the the lead apron. They'll just kind of wear that as long as it's comfortable for them. Um, so there's kind of we've kind of implemented ways around it in the early stages. Now it's not as much of a concern. Very awesome. 
Okay, well, um, you know, let's. Why don't we close this up? Thank you so much again for both teams. Uh, again, that's Major Guyad uh, from Bagotville and our team on Op Impact, Master Corporal McNeil and Captain Zeeler. I've been saying his name wrong the whole time. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super sorry. And what we're going to do is we'll put uh, okay. listed. And uh, any last points there, uh, Andrew? Nothing for me. No, it was uh, thank you for my, so much for arranging this, uh, Ashley. It's great to have these webinars. Oh, no worries, man. And uh, our team in uh, on on impact. Any last points? No, I just want to say thanks for giving us the opportunity to let us show the rest of Canada how we are um, kind of dealing with COVID and um, our use of our PPE over here now. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's nice to talk to everybody back home and see the familiar names. But, mm -hmm. uh, should do this more often. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much, and we'll. Uh, have a safe trip. Stay safe. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thanks, sir. Take care. Good night, everyone. See ya.